We are excited to be here. Come on in. There's plenty of seats. People seats everywhere. Put their hand People up. People let you know. Uh, we're excited to be here and appreciate you all joining us to kick off DripCon 2024. I hope everyone is well caffeinated and ready to jump into learning about accessibility audits. The live captions will be on uh, the top of the page, so you'll see how those capture what we say. Um, and even during the demo, we'll keep the captions running above the demo. I'm Kath Kathy Beck from Massachusetts, a senior UX engineer at UMF, and I've been at UMF for nine and a half years. I primarily work on Drupal sites, building, and theming. Um, I'm on UMF's DEI advisory board and one of the company's accessibility subject matter experts. I started working in Drupal back in 2006 and have been presenting on accessibility since 2017. All right. Oh, all right, good, we'll figure this out. So good morning. Um, I'm Julie Elman, Senior Digital Project Manager working at OOMF. I've been there for about eight years now, practicing accessibility for about seven of those years. And my passion for accessibility started at a very young age. So one of my first jobs was working at a summer camp for kids with special needs and even peers with special needs. I'd be working with people that were my age as well. So accessibility has kind of blossomed in my life and is something that I'm very passionate about now that I work with Drupal and websites. So it's something we get to think about every day. So today's discussion, we're really happy that you're all here. So thank you for joining us. We're gonna learn a lot about accessibility. Um, first, we want everybody to understand why accessibility matters. Obviously, this has been a topic that's been around for some time, um, but there may be some people here that still need to learn a little bit about the basics. So we'll spend a few moments on that. We'll talk about the components of an audit, the way that we do them at OOMF. Uh, talk about staying informed and the importance of that. We'll also review some case studies and Kathy's gonna walk us through some of the development tools um, that the team utilizes in order to test sites, get a sense of how accessible things are looking and then give us the path to what work do we need to do to remediate and really what's the right size for some of our clients as well as for your organization and helping to position yourself a little bit better within a grid that we've put together. So there will be a QR code that'll come up on screen a few times. If you don't catch it during one of the first times, it'll be on the last slide. But basically it's a list of accessibility resources that Kathy and I have compiled with our team over the course of many years. So if you're really new to accessibility or you just need a refresher on tools and different guidelines, you can check out that link. It's always available um, to you. So make sure to snap it on screen when it's there. So we wanna learn a little bit about who's in the audience just to make sure that we tailor the conversation in the best way that we can. So starting with uh, developers and engineers, who here is an engineer? Okay, a good amount of hands, probably maybe 40% of the audience. Um, who here is a project or account manager? Okay, we've got, yeah, probably 15. And then what about a business owner? Anybody here? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, content admin, all right, awesome. Y'all are very important. And uh, the marketing and sales team, anybody there? All right, awesome, another like seven or so folks. So really good group of people here. Anybody that we missed? Okay, awesome. So Kathy also has a question for us. And uh, we'd like to know what your experience level with accessibility is. Is it a beginner, intermediate, advanced? Do we have beginners in here? Oh, just a few beginners. What about intermediate? Oh, nice. lots of hands here. And what about advanced? A good awesome. amount, yeah, nice. Great, all right, so we wanna make sure that we have a level playing field coming in here talking about accessibility, making sure that everybody understands why accessibility matters. So the census has actually reported that about 20% of folks have a disability that can potentially impact their usage of a website. That's a really large majority of our population. Maybe it's, it's a minority, but it's a large group and a large bit of the population. That's one in five people. So we really think that it's important and obviously the laws are also dictating that it's very important that imagine 20% 20, 20 of your end users cannot actually complete the actions on your web platform that you're intending them to complete. That's a lot of re lost revenue and also it leads to potential legal, legal implications as well as ethical implications too. 
So let's dig into just some general types of disability so that we can all think about the vast uh, types that are out there. So there was a really great survey um, done about accessibility and accessibility matters obviously for physical spaces, it's been legal for a long time. You must adhere to the uh, compliance of having a space that has elevators or ramps, those types of, of standards. Um, but obviously the web has become a lot more prevalent that we have our websites more accessible. So from this survey of nearly 1,300 people, 58 people actually, or 58% rather, identify that they have some type of disability, whether it's cognitive, vision, blindness, anything on that spectrum. But it gets a little bit more interesting too um, because there are different types of accessibility that can, uh, that can impact how you interact with the world and uh, web platforms. So we've got touch, sight, hearing, speech. And then these all go into different types of categories, the layers of uh, is it a permanent situation, a permanent disability where you're dealing with uh, you know, a lost limb or blindness? Is it something that's temporary, which I've experienced. I fell down snowboarding a broken arm and I couldn't use a computer anymore because it was not gonna work for my fingers. Um, that's something we can all, all relate to and it's, it's something that could happen to anybody sitting in this room. Also situational, which could also apply to any of us anytime you're carrying groceries, a new baby, you may need to interact with a website in a slightly different way when you only have one hand available to you. So all of these things are important and that is part of the reason that you should see yourself as an accessible website platform and user. And it should help to give you reason to stick to accessibility standards a little bit more closely because it could be you. It's not just these other people, it's all of us. So just like web development, we're all here about Drupal, right? There's a million ways to solve one, one problem. Um, that's very much the same way with accessibility audits or a cup of coffee. We all like it a little bit different. So you need to think for yourselves about what type of accessibility audit is right for you, for your organization and your skill set. So we're gonna introduce the, the grid here that we have put together for the types of audits that we generally run for our clients and for our teams. Um, they range from small, medium, and large, and beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And we've even, as an organization, gone through kind of the evolution to go from beginner, intermediate, and advanced, uh, to the point that when we started our accessibility audits many years ago, we were working with outside vendors that were the accessibility experts, to the point that now we have evolved our skill sets to be able to uh, serve an advanced audit just internally and be very comfortable with all of the work and the deliverables that need to come out of it. So you'll see this grid a lot during our case studies and just throughout the presentation. And this is something that you can ladder up your audits to as you think about the future for your platform. So the things that you need to think about when you're trying to decide on your audit are starting with the people. So who's involved? Who is your stakeholder, right? Who is going to be the decision maker of how much money you're gonna get to be able to audit and remediate your web platform? Who's the auditing team or the accessibility expert that you'll work with in order to ensure compliance? And then you need your development team. A lot of you in here are that team that is going to be responsible for taking these things and putting them into action. The work is the next piece, right? Deciding on the scope, which is really important because there's a lot of standards out there. Which standard applies to you? Most commonly we see pe people are adhering to WCAG AA compliance. Kathy will go in a little bit more to what that means as we do some demos. The timeline and the budget, which is really defined by your stakeholder, by, by your organization. Uh, the tools, we'll go through a, a long list of those very shortly. Um, but they're also dependent upon how much money do you have to put towards a paid tool or third party system? Um, and what's your timeline? Because some things can take longer than other things. And then uh, the deliverables. So let me, oh, let me get back to uh, the deliverables should include uh, potentially a uh, VPAT, which can be known as a voluntary product assessment template. Kathy will show us that later, uh, but that's a really good system to have in place to document your intentions with accessibility and just making sure that you understand where you fall in compliance or non-compliance. And lastly, remediation efforts. So just thinking through um, the work that you need to do upfront, it can be a lot of work, but as, as an ongoing effort, the work becomes a whole lot less. So invest early and then just maintain. So this is commonly how you would see a list of tools, right? So automated reports and services. 
a lot of these are, are listed in the deck. They're also listed in our resources guide, so you can check that out. Um, but this is a pretty common way to look at them. Now, we feel like it's, it's important that people understand and start to see themselves where they land as far as what are the right tools for them and their teams. So we have gone ahead and we put together, you still see the groupings, the logical groupings that you would see. So automated reports and services, manual tests and scans, custom devices and assistive technologies, which are commonly the tools that actual end users would leverage if they needed to interact with your platform. So you can see those start to move towards the more intermediate and advanced skill sets, like voiceover, a little more achievable. Um, but some of these other devices, like a sip and puff breath switch, much more complicated, and also uh, you need to have access to one of those systems. So definitely make sure to refer back to this. And then I'm a project manager, so I'm always thinking about the timeline. So this is really a mock timeline, um, but it's something to keep in mind so that you can understand the phases that will come after an audit. So your audit will likely take a month, maybe two months, and then you have to think about how you're actually going to implement and make that actionable and get your site to be accessible. So first off, we always review our findings and we start to understand the level of effort. Then we wanna break those down and prioritize based off of what's just simply an annoyance versus what is actually going to be a blocker. We create a remediation plan. So that's basically how are we going to fix these things? And start to assign resources, right? So that we can ensure that we have the right staff to support the project. We start remediation. And then it's important, and for our content admin out here, we need to prioritize accessibility as an ongoing effort. It is all of your responsibilities to make sure that the site stays accessible for your end users for legal and e ethical reasons. And then uh, what we really suggest is just the, uh, the ongoing maintenance and getting into the structure of the retest and repeat. So whatever cadence you choose, whether it be quarterly, monthly, annually, just make sure that you're revisiting it because it's a huge hill to climb up to get to an accessible platform. And if you let go of it, you're gonna keep having to climb that hill rather than having smaller iterative tasks that you can resolve. So Kathy's gonna share with us a little bit more about what remediation looks like. Remediation, Remediation will look different for each project. After running a few audits, you will start to see common issues getting flagged. We listed the ones we see on a regular basis, such as color contrast, header, order, um, link in alt text, uh, modals, carousels, forms, filters, data tables. And with Drupal's continued effort to make core uh, WCAG AA compliant, this means if you use the public and admin themes and don't override features, out of the box, the functionality should be compliant. We wanted to mention a couple of gotchas, um, things to remember when it comes to accessibility. Uh, there are a lot of services out there. Make sure that if a company is offering remediation and fixes, that the approach is not to add an overlay widget and call it fixed. If it's if it sounds too good to be true, uh, it probably is. Um, also, you are responsible for all the content under your domain name. This includes third-party embeds such as YouTube and Vimeo videos or social media feeds. Let's move on to what we can do right away. Uh, you first, you can add a accessibility issue link this can allow users to help you by self-reporting issues they are experiencing. And this link can bring the users to a page where they get a web form or even just a simple mail to link with the subject pre-filled. Uh, you can also provide a web accessibility statement outlining your commitment to being compliant with the latest standards. And like most things related to the internet, accessibility standards are changing. Sometimes change is fast, sometimes it is slow. Uh, but this April, the Department of Justice had a final signing to update Title II under the American with Disabilities Act that will require all local, district, and state government agencies, websites, and apps to be WCAG AA compliant 
within two or three years. And this is dependent on the entity's population. Um, and per, our th per the theme of our talk, accessibility remediation will look different for each project. And we'd like to share a few of our case studies and demo some of the tools and services we've worked with. Um, we do have a quick note that some of our client business and partner names have been redacted due to contractual agreements. We are also planning to have some time at the, the end for some questions on any of the tools that we show. So let's move on to our first case study. Go Ask Alice is our most recent case study with the new site and design launching in a couple weeks. Um, the goal of this project was to streamline the content editorial process with for a team that wears many hats. We also wanted to make sure that con this content heavy site stayed accessible. For this, we used the Drupal module editorially because it provided an overview report as well as a per page suggestion that happened when the page saves. This feature is important because you need the entire page's context to get what an accurate report of the page. Here's how this project maps out to our many shapes and sizes grid. This project's accessibility scope is a medium and with a beginner to intermediate uh, experience level. And the main takeaways from this project is going back to basics in the form of simplicity in the design with minimum in imagery and videos. Development didn't use layout builder, didn't use paragraphs. It was just pages, views, blocks. Um, and we used editorially, like I mentioned. And I will do a quick demo. Yeah, and for you content admin, editorial is like my favorite tool, so. Install it if you don't already have it. it. Makes our lives a lot easier. Here we go. So this is the page on the site. I changed this header two to a header three. You can see we're getting a flag here that there's some issues detected. And this is getting flagged. It will it'll give you a little explanation. Uh, you're able to hide this from yourself or hide it for everyone. We can come over here and see the outline and see that it's skipping a header level. If we were to edit this and put it to an H2, this would go away. And then I also want to show what, um, under reports, content accessibility, this is what the main report looks like. Um, it gives you a listing of all saved pages and how they fall within this content information. There's also a section here where it will list any of those dismissals uh, we, we talked about a minute ago. For our second case study, we will look at the national healthcare provider where we were partnering with an agency, an auditing agency. The partnering agency took a list of the a case studies that we created and ran it through, ran the site through SortSite. And they did user testing in JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, and ZoomText. This project also had a lot of PDFs and custom code that needed to be remediated. This project was definitely large in scope and the experience needed extended across all three levels, especially because all of the user testing done across all the multiple devices. Because this project was large in scope, we definitely learned a lot and had to be extremely organized. Um, our WCAG knowledge in general increased and we started working with VPACs and remediated over 30 PDFs for that for that project. Um, we are going to demo what a VPAT and looks like. And just as a side note, when you're using an automated tool like SortSite, which is a great way to get a list of your issues in one place, 
there can be a lot of false positives and sword site does not have a user experience that allows you to ignore things like Kathy showed you with editorially. So it becomes a little bit clunky in that way. You need to basically be able to monitor a false positive or there may just be things outside of your control such as YouTube might flag something with a video and uh, you just know that it's out of the scope of, of what you're able to resolve and the only solution to get your site 100% compliant would be to choose a different system. I was right. So, oh, I think I called it back. Here we go. So the ITI site is where you can find a VPAT. Um, <coughs> a VPAT is a voluntary product accessibility template. And um, you can see that there's a more, more up-to-date report, the accessibility conformance report, um, more specific to web and accessibility. Uh, the section 508 gov site has a good document or article on how to create a ACR from a VPAT if you already have one. Um, it also has a nice page on what an accessibility conformance report is. And it actually has a nice tool which is, is linked from this page um, that lets you fill in information about your product, which is your website, um, and then we'll walk you through some of the um, criteria. Cri it's a lot easier than it used to be. Yep, now. so for this you have web, so this is our website. If you don't have any videos or audio on your site, you can just say it's not applicable. Um, if you're not be testing documentation, you can also say this is not applicable or not evaluated. Software, um, if it's web, you're not building software, but if it's a web app, this, this could be um, where you add those notes. And then if you wanted to make the back end a Drupal and make sure that's uh, compliant for your editors, you can also have a separate option there. And if you review this, you can see that it provides a pretty detailed uh, document that looks very similar to a VPAT, if anybody's familiar with that uh, report. And, and this can be linked in your website. Um, I'd also like to show you what a sort site report looks like. So this is a desktop app for sort site, a uh, paid service. Uh, I did a quick scan of my company's homepage and we have a couple accessibility issues being flagged. Uh, there's one level A and one level double A and three triple A, which we're not aiming for. We're aiming for the double A for this site. Uh, here's one of those kind of false positives in a sense where it's looking at your CSS and you might have made a conscious t decision to do something with it, position something off. I've also seen um, bold font get flagged, saying that you should use strong markup, the strong tag, if you're trying to emphasize uh, actual content semantically. Um, and then this one is a color contrast issue, which I actually opened up a Jira issue ticket for my team to fix since I found this the other day. Um, and there are some options within uh, this, this system where you can turn on errors, broken links, compatibility for different operating s or different browsers, um, search standards, usability. You're able to have determine when it runs and different options for your report. And these are really great, like as, as that part of the creating the remediation plan, we'll often look to a tool like Sourcesite as to, to flag for us, what are the, what are the to-do list items that we need to work on? And obviously, as Kathy mentioned, AAA is there. Obviously, it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to hit that AAA compliance, but our tick list is going to include A or AA first. Our next case study, we'll look at our higher education nonprofits audit through the Department of Education. <coughs> the DOE's audit team was very knowledgeable and were able to help us flesh out approaches uh, for this project. 
due to the Department of Education's knowledge around accessibility and the higher education audience, we were able to target our testing to specific pages and functionalities of the website. This was extremely helpful as it allowed us to streamline our testing, and which was across two sites, making the old site get through mediation and making sure the new site is built accessible from the start. And I'm just gonna add one thing based on a conversation I had earlier. So it, your website may have 10,000 pages on it and in order to make that, that hill a little bit more um, achievable to uh, get over, sometimes it's easier just to pick like 13 pages, different templates, different content types, run the tests against those and that'll help to reel in your focus. Um, that way you're able to just get started because sometimes it can feel really, really overwhelming when you get a sort site report with like 100 things on it. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. And to piggyback on that, maybe s start with your highest traffic um, pages. Look at your analytics, see where your traffic's going and, and start there. And because of all the moving pieces of this project, we would classify this audit as large in scope. We, If we didn't need to remediate the old site, which we didn't build, so we didn't know the code, this project could have stayed in the beginner to, in, uh, beginner to intermediate experience levels. One of the first things that the Department of Education had us do was add a report and accessibility issue form, which had a link to the site, which had a link in the site's footer and was displaying on every page. And all the testing was manual in, in the browser. Um, one other thing to add here too is actually there was a legal deadline for this work. So there was a claim that was open since it is a college. Um, there was a user, a potential applicant that had issues being able to actually apply to this college. And so it was elevated to the Department of Education and that's where we stepped in to help out as really co-accessibility experts. We just happened to have the knowledge at this point that we could work really collaboratively with the Department of Education through the remediation. And you know, just having the report and accessibility issue page on your site or form or email link, um, it shows your intention to be more accessible. And I think that while, you know, I'm not giving you legal advice, um, but I think that it gives, it shows your intention to be accessible and it maybe could introduce a little bit more leniency if they know that you're working on things, which is also how a VPAC can help you out. So accessibility doesn't happen overnight. Um, but having that form also gives you an opportunity to have free real user accessibility testing so that they can submit issues that they find. And it also, it, so it lowers the investment for your team. So it's, it's great free support. So with this, we spent a lot of time just learning, figuring out how to remediate our issues on the site. I referenced this quick reference um, site a lot. It's the features and the information provided here have uh, increased over the years tenfold. Um, I'm going to show some of the tabbing um, testing we would do. So I'm going to just take my keyboard and uh, tab, which brings me to the first link in the header there. And then it tabs me over to the sidebar to hide the sidebar navigation. And if I hit the space bar, it closes. If I hit it again, it opens. I can tab and get to it. one of the filter tabs. Click that and you get into it. Tab back and I can close it to get into my content, which I hit the buttons along the top of the list here first. We can hit our space button and open them all and tab through. And this is, this is really critical. I mean, this structure and functionality that Kathy's showing is, is really important for user using tabbing, but also for screen readers having the proper markup. So I know you'll get to that shortly. Um, yep, so I'm going to open Chrome's inspector tool and the accessibility tree here takes the markup and puts it in uh, human readable terms. Here you can see we have the, the main content of the site. We have a button and we have the label of it. We have if it's focusable. Um, 
you can open it up and see some static text if it's loaded. We also have, uh, let me go back up here, uh, some more buttons. Uh, we have a list here. If we open that list, we see there's three list items. We open it up and you can see what that text is. And all of those areas that Kathy is tabbing to have the focusable true. So they're kind of a destination for you when you're tabbing through. And all of this will inform devices and assistive uh, technologies on what to do. So if your markup is readable and validated, then devices should be able to consume that and interact as needed. Uh, I'm gonna show a few add-ons. Um, I was just gonna reiterate Kathy's point about back to basics. Part of the reason that we had such, such a successful time with the Glass Gallus project is because of the simplicity of, of the structure. So definitely keep that in mind. It's fun to do fancy things, um, but it doesn't always benefit the end user when it comes to accessibility. All right, so up here in my Chrome add-ons, I have this icon for Wave. Um, Oh, in the beginning, this might feel overwhelming because they turn on everything. They turn on warnings, errors, um, just aerial label tags. Uh, you can come into the details tab and toggle these off. And then you can really just see some of the alerts. Uh, let's get down to some more general ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. So that's how you can use this, find, find the information. There's other tabs that provide other information for this, but this is a free uh, Chrome extension. And I also want to show, um, I'm gonna reload and show the web accessibility disability simulator. So this will show um, some color blindness and how folks might see colors on your site. Uh, I thought it was interesting. They also gave a sunshine option. So if you're using your laptop or, or phone out in the sun, um, this is how someone might see it. Uh, also the, the concentration one I thought was um, interesting. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, and then the the read and write. For so for dyslexia, it will show how some of the words will will switch and change on folks as they're reading um, and provide a difficult time interacting with the content on your site. And that's a really beneficial feature, I feel like, for your graphic design team, um, just so that they're more mindful of what the experience might be for somebody. If we don't you know, have some of these disabilities firsthand or know somebody, it may be new to them. And uh, it's important to think about that as you're designing. Did you say Wave? <coughs> wave and then Web Disability Simulator. Yeah, you want to see the Web Disability Simulator. Our final case study for today was a project to create and implement a design system for the state of Rhode Island's 100 plus governmental agencies. For this, our team used Aquir Site Factory and Pattern Lab to create a combination of color themes and page components that allows the RI DocGov team to deliver timely and information, informative content in a consistent and scalable way. Because the team was building the design system within these established frameworks, the scope here was a medium. And as we do ongoing maintenance and WCAG criteria changes, we're able to update and span themes and features to meet the new standards. With building out the design system's color themes, there's a lot of colors and size combinations that can happen. It is important to do a lot of testing with your brand and theme colors. Um, I'm going to demo some color contrast um, tools. And I didn't ask earlier, but who here is a designer? Anyone? Okay, good. Yeah, about 15, 20 folks. So yeah, this is also great, um, great tools for you folks to check out when you're thinking about your design system, especially if you have a multi-site where things 
can be customized. Uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated to figure out all the combinations. So for, for this tool, what, what we like about it is that it, oh, that it offers, well, what is this? <laughs> Live demos. <laughs> um, it offers a couple ways to view colors. Uh, we really like that you're able to add a list of colors, so your whole brand palette you can paste it in and, and get your ratios. This first column is all the, the, the original colors you put. We have hue, saturation, and lightness va values that you can tweak just a little bit to maybe get your, your link color to, to be accessible and hit that color contrast. Uh, this column tests against white, a dark co light color. This one tests against a light color. And then this fourth column tests against other colors within your list to see which co color in your palette is accessible with this color. Also, what's nice is you can take, uh, maybe you have a style guide that just has swatches of uh, colors, you can a new one and I can upload an image and get the same get an, a set of values here um, the light and dark values can actually change under settings if you're using the tr true black versus this 1010 we are um, you can change that and run a new test and it will run these against those dark and light colors we also have uh, an option here to see all the, the colors you've tested in the past and look at them again. And uh, I have a history of being a graphic designer uh, in my past and that uh, ability to adjust the, the uh, hue, saturation, and lightness um, just so that you can like tweak ever so slightly. We've had a number of clients that their brand colors are just a little bit off you could tweak it by like a couple of points and then you have an accessible web color. So um, it's important to keep in mind, but you do get the new uh, hex code as well. So it's really, really helpful um, just to see how far off you are and maybe you just need to add a new color to your palette. Also, there, this was a cool like data set, color data set um, that allows you to pick the number of colors you want. Um, you can check some uh, options here, but I like that it gave um, some nice color sets for large data. All right, I'm back. So now that we've shown you some samples of what you can do, how you can test, since we do have a number of engineers in here, I want to just recap this for everybody so you can think about what's the right what's the right size audit for you. What does that look like? So go ahead. Revisiting our old friend, the accessibility grid. So is it a small? Is it a medium? Is it a large? Are you doing full testing and remediation? Or are you serving a purpose where you're just doing the testing and somebody else will do the work? We've had both of these scenarios as we showed you. It could be possible that you're doing your own testing and there's an external vendor that's going to do the remediation or vice versa. Both things to, to keep in mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, as you go through here, there's just like, there's a variety of things that you can pick and choose. And ours were pretty well aligned with their um, general grid structure, but you can you can pick and choose. This works for us. You can also reinvent the wheel and, and do something that's a little bit more well suited for you in your organization. So summarizing what we talked about in the beginning, the questions that you need to ask yourself, right? So 
who's going to be the, the, the person that you need to have involved in the audit? Is it that you're going to do everything internally to your organization like we've done before? Is it that you're going to work with the Department of Education? Are you going to work with live testers and work with a vendor that can partner with those testers? Um, you need to make sure that you're fully staffed in order to actually make that work actionable because an audit is nothing without the outcomes of a remediation unless you're doing perfect already. The scope and focus, making sure that you figure out where you align within the compliance standards and the existing legal regulations around accessibility. You should determine what's your motivator. Is it that you have an open claim against your college or is it something that you're just doing proactively, which is always the best case scenario. Um, you wanna make sure that you understand your key focus areas of the website. So is it that you have these uh, key conversions that you have to have on the site, like registering to apply to a college or checking out with a newsletter or making a conversion on your site to buy something. So all of those things are very important. And then you need to understand who your audience is, um, just so that you can better understand you know, what type of disabilities you may need to work with the most. Uh, if you're working with a more elderly group, you might wanna make sure that you have font switchers uh, to make the font size a little bit bigger, those types of things. What's the size of your audience and what's the impact, which really we should be doing this for any size and audience, um, but for the, the legal regulations too, there's also timelines that are applied based off of the large, you know, the size of your population that you're working to support. You don't wanna be Domino's Pizza and end up in, in legal uh, hot water. The timeline and budget, so um, what's the total budget that you actually have to execute on this work? How much time do you have to complete it? There's more than just the budget, so again, the audit, the documentation, the remediation, and then how complex is your site? Uh, as Kathy mentioned, if you stay pretty uh, regular within Drupal Core's basic functionality and what it comes with, you're gonna stay pretty accessible other than the content that you need to maintain, um, but then you might have some really highly customizable forms or uh, map data or other sort of interactive elements that you need to really work to make accessible. The tools and processes, so you'll revisit that grid that we shared with you of like the skill set that you need to have for your tools. What's the, what's the price point? Some of them are much more expensive than others, some being free. Um, most of the ones that Kathy just demoed are free with the exception, I believe, of, of sort site being the only one, um, but we do ut utilize some other screen readers that you do have to pay for, like JAWS, which is very commonly utilized. The audit deliverables, so we talked about the VPAT, the ACR, um, your roadmap, how are you actually gonna implement this and revisit your work, and then the web accessibility statement, um, and maybe adding that form to your site to report an accessibility issue. And then lastly, the audit remediation, right? So what's your development experience? Are you going to be doing it yourself? Is it going to be working with a partner? What does that look like? So here's that resource. We've got it again. We can toggle back if need be, if this one's too small for the folks in the back. Um, but that's web accessibility and uh, choosing the right audit size for you. So are there any questions from the crowd? Yes, you first. I, I, I fall back to links go somewhere, buttons do something. Oh, I thank you. I was supposed to do that. The question was, what's the difference? Is there anything specific for links and buttons? And how important is it to distinguish the two? Um, links go somewhere, buttons do something. And th that should help kind of navigate that. So some might, uh, some might give you, um, I've seen if, if you have a button and you have like a div inside the button for some reason, it, it'll do flag those. Um, I don't think I've actually seen it flag non buttons that do something. Yeah. I think that's one of the like manual beauties testings. of a manual test. Yeah. Like you get somebody who understands the expectations and then the key is consistency. Just be consistent on your site and, and make sure to set user expectations. I see somebody just celebrating that. Yeah, just be consistent because that's important for your end user. And did you have another part to that question or is that it? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay, uh, hand over here. Okay. Mm. 
Honestly, we haven't had Repeat to. the question. The, <laughs> the question was about languages and how, how these tools might um, test against language. We, we haven't done too much of that. Um, we have one site that runs a Spanish, uh, so using Drupal languages, it has the, the ES um, folder structure. Um, it, it runs through it. it it will look for the language tag in the markup, and, and that will determine if you're looking at English language or Spanish language or some other, other language. Is really uh, lay heavy into your language tags and your left-right text orientation, mm -hmm. and that should help a lot. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. SwordSight has called out before, like the reading uh, direction, it has flagged before for us on sites that are multilingual. But I would say a lot of it comes down to just the semantic structure and no matter the language, you're gonna get flagged if you have headers out of order and that structure is hidden from the user, but it's still there in you know, our plain English. Um, yes, okay, so you had a second question. Yeah. So maybe for like embedded videos. Um, question. Oh okay, so, so <laughs> the second question. No, it's it's okay. Um, so the second question was, um, if if something is flagging a false positive, should you go to another tool? Basically, um, you can test it with a couple tools to see if it's like consistently flagging it. Uh, if you don't want to see YouTube videos getting flagged on your site or it, it's causing an issue. One thing you can do is link users off your site so you're, they're no longer under your domain and go to YouTube, go to Vimeo, and then the accessibility of that is under their responsibility mm -hmm. because it's under their domain. Yep. Question right there in the middle. And also with question, the question was about um, when you're being very intentional about your styles, should you just fall back to like the semantics and the standards? Um, because you know not everything is going to be accessible. So at what point are you comfortable with things being a little bit inaccessible, right? If you just know that this is part of your brand standard and maybe it's not like a critical user experience uh, impacting, you know, instance. Is that true? Is that inadequate? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say know what you're okay with, know, know which level you want to hit, but also a VPAC is a voluntary product. It, you're volunteering this information, you're, you're saying, hey, our site might not be 100%. We know that this thing might be flagged, uh, and you can be honest about it um, and, and put that in your report. It's the intention, yeah. Over to you, Caesar. Yes, yeah, so there are tools out there that can, oh, yes. <laughs> See? I was listening See? too hard, yeah, yeah, my mistake. So the question that Caesar <laughs> had was that you could have PDFs across your organization that are, um, they, PDFs are notoriously difficult to make accessible um, just because they're very visual. So there are tools out there. If you check out this uh, Scan for Accessibility Resources link, there are a lot of tools out there that you can leverage. And then there are also services that will remediate PDFs for you, I think for as low as like $7. And it ends up being like a little bit cheaper sometimes to do it that way than it is to do it in-house. Um, but it is important to do it and, and educate your team uh, to try and make them accessible in InDesign or whatever tool that they're leveraging because you can. It's a lot harder to do it after. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, what feedback about the, the, the yeah. 
So yeah, what, what analytics or uh, KPIs are you measuring pre or post remediation? And we, we typically focus, or at least right now, what I use as a source of truth for a lot of projects I manage are the web core vitals that we can get for um, uh, Lighthouse reporting from Google. Um, so basically checking on those, but if you have a service like Site Improve or something like that, you're able to leverage that information as well. They out of the box will give you kind of your score and how you stack up. It's a paid system versus free for the web core vitals. All right, maybe one last question. Over there, yeah. Okay, so I'll repeat the question and then Kathy can answer on it. So the question is for the submit a web accessibility issue form, what type of data points or questions are we getting from folks? I think it would be important to get the person's email so you could get back to them if you don't fully understand what the issue is. Uh, have a place for them to describe the issue they're experiencing and potentially capture the URL that they came from. Uh, maybe do that behind the scenes and not make the user uh, fill that information, but that's an important piece of information as well. And we've gotten, I mean, I've, I've had clients get uh, forms submitted for like this button doesn't make any sense type of text. Uh, so yeah, definitely keep an eye out for that. And we have a booth at 519, so I know we've got still some questions. Um, so if folks wanna come visit us there, we'll be there throughout the course of the day. But thank you all for joining us, and we're excited to see you at the Dries Note.